One of the Australian politicians I mentioned in my opening editorial is LNP Senator Jared Reddick. I'm delighted to say he joins me now. Jared, thank you for your time. I, I said in my opening that words are cheap. Action is a price too high for most politicians to pay to put a stop to the cultural rot. You've been prepared to pay that price. What's your experience been in Parliament? Uh, good evening, Corey. And I have to say that was quite the uh, opening speech you gave there tonight. I'm not sure that uh, it was the best thing that you actually left politics. Uh, you've certainly got plenty of fire left in your belly. Uh, look, you know, politics uh, has been an interesting experience for me. Uh, I think the thing that has struck me the most is the in, uh, uh, unwillingness by our leadership to take accountability uh, for their responsibilities. Uh, this is an incredibly position, uh, posi uh, privileged position that we are in, and we are dealing with people's lives and livelihoods. This isn't a football contest where we're talking about points on a scoreboard. We are talking about the well-being of every individual Australian citizen, uh, and in some cases, obviously, uh, we have our, our actions have consequences overseas as well. Uh, but we have to remember that, and, and that's you know when I give my stump speech when I go around. Uh, parts of Queensland and Australia, I always say what drives me is the gratitude that I have towards my forefathers and that inspires me to make sure that our children get the same opportunities our forefathers gave to us and to make sure that we fight for everyone that gets out of bed every day and puts their nose to the grindstone. And we have to remember that. And that is the outcome that we have to achieve is that we get better opportunities for our children. So we need to be outcome focused. Many people in leadership roles, whether it's in government or the corporate sector or the superannuation sector or union sector, are driven by their own personal goals rather than sovereign outcomes that are going to lift the boat for all Australians. And that's what we have to do as politicians. That is, you know, the most important thing we can do. Jared, one of the things I always thought was that people go into politics, they should have some principles and framework in which defines how they're going to approach or respond to a problem. When they're abandoned uh, in political thought, then this traditional left-right divide becomes a united, whatever we can get away with policy approach. I don't think that's good for voters or the country. Um, and I think it's resulted in a, a dearth of real leadership that we've experienced in this, in this nation for quite some time now. How would you respond to that criticism? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a fair point. I sort of touched on it in the first statement. But the thing is that what I found is coming into government, this is my first government role in Australia, is the lack of quality assurance in regards to decision-making. We are today driven by modellers and not measurers. So, you know, for example, just recently in estimates, I asked the new CSIRO chief, which of the one of the 40 models will Australia be applying uh, to calculate net zero and is there any regulatory arbitrage in that where Australia is going to get shafted because we aren't using the same models as other people? And he just brushed it off and said, well, the great thing about science is, is that we can all use different models and still come to the same result. And then I was chopped off by the chair. People don't take their decision-making uh, responsibilities serious enough. And we need to be basing our decisions on facts, not feelings. And unfortunately today, because the media... Uh, you know, uh, uh, and you know, we have such a one-sided media in the sense that all media pushes a narrative, regardless of whatever that narrative is. It is always you have to be on the side of the narrative, or you are otherwise a conspiracy theorist. The idea that you can actually have free thought and challenge the status quo or the particular narrative of the day—it's—it's it's virtually uh, political suicide to do that. You've summed that up beautifully there, Senator. Hey, um, can I jump to some domestic policies? The government misinformation bill looms large, and I'm guessing it supports my previous point. It was essentially a coalition policy. Uh, it was wrong then. I believe it's wrong now. But what's changed from the coalition's perspective that apparently now they oppose the bill that they supported when they were in government? Uh Peter Dutton's in charge. Uh, I think that Peter has got a very good grip of people on the ground in Australia. Uh, I actually live in his electorate of Dixon. Uh, I know uh, that his true heart and soul lies with uh, the people, hard-working people of Australia. Uh, I know where we have our FDC meeting and I know those people there are hard-working Australians. And I think Peter gets it. I think that uh, he's well aware that we overreached in the last government. Uh, and that, you know, if we basically stand in the middle of the road or you'll get hit by a bus or if we adopt our opponent's arguments, which is what happened in the last government, uh, we ended up with less seats than we ever had in our uh, party's history. 
And Peter is determined to get back to conservative values. And I think that's why he, he understands that it's all about, democracy is all about protecting the individual, empowering the individual, and actually restraining the power of the institutions, uh, in particular the government, the universities and the media that are all getting a free pass under this particular bill. Yeah, mate, you've said it beautifully there, I have to say. Um, another thing you did beautifully, you didn't get hit by a bus. I think you were driving a bus through Senate Estimates the other day. You had a bit of a Barney with the Secretary of the Environment Infrastructure Department who complained about the number of questions he was being asked. Have a look at this. How many people work in your department? Uh, just under 2,000. Really. Under 2,000? Yeah. So you've been asked 400 questions. That's, that's one question per five staff and what, you've got 20 days to answer it? We also have other, we have other functions to perform. Oh, I realise that, but you're basically complaining about answering one, every, one in every five staff having to answer one question over four I'm five not weeks complaining. to answer. I'm not complaining. I'm pushing back on complaints from committee members uh, that we were late in terms of the delivery of our questions on notice. Well, isn't and that, I'm explaining isn't that, that, isn't that an and appropriate I'm explaining complaint? That. Excuse me, I'm, I'm asking the questions here. Isn't that an well, appropriate complaint if you've got 2,000 staff, our job as senators is to ask questions and you're complaining about us doing our jobs. Jared, later on, we found out 100 of those 2,000 pen pushers are on more than 200 grand a year, and they still couldn't answer the questions uh, in ti a timely manner. This is uh, crazy, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And it just epitomises our bureaucracy who gets, you know, who are paid way above the average hardworking Australian salary and they think it's too much to actually answer questions to the people who pay their salaries or the representatives, i.e. the senators, uh, about the, the conduct of their departments. I mean, there's only three Senate estimates uh, a, a year. So when I said you've only got to answer one question every four weeks for every five staff you have, they've only got to do that three times a year. So it, it's absurd that they think that's too hard, given that, you know, we're asking questions about their own department. This is what democracy is all about, is about transparency and accountability. And the bureaucrats don't want a part of it. And, that, and you know, as we saw in the yes vote or the, or, the, or the referendum, I mean, these people are divorced from reality. They are divorced from the rest of the country. They certainly are. And the reason it takes them so long to answer a question is because they need to add words without disclosing any of the information you really want to know, lest they get themselves into trouble for having gold-plated coffee machines or yoga lessons or something like that. Senator Jared Rennick, exactly you right, are a Corey. voice of reason and common sense. So thanks so much for joining me on Bernardi and you keep up the great work in Parliament.